You're listening to the voice of Russia in London. I'm James Rinal, and we're taking a look at using economic sanctions against errant leaders. This week, the United States, Saudi Arabia, and dozens of other countries have agreed to heap further economic sanctions on Syria. They want to deter President Bashar al-Assad from repressing his people with a cocktail of travel bans, financial curbs, and an arms embargo. But judging by the massacres in Hula and Hama, it is perhaps fair to say that this diplomatic stick is not proving so effective. Maybe this is because Russia and China are blocking tougher sanctions through the UN Security Council. Or maybe it is because sanctions just aren't much of a deterrent. In fact, when talking about sanctions, there are always a lot of maybes. Was Iran brought back the nuclear negotiating table by successive rounds of crippling sanctions? Has Myanmar embraced democratic reforms because of years of sanctions? and censure? Did sanctions end apartheid in South Africa? Were those on Iraq cruel or those against Cuba ridiculous? The answer to all these questions can be reduced to that single word, maybe. But to get something firmer on the diplomatic game of carrots and sticks, we're hosting a discussion in our London studio. I'm joined by David Patrick Harakos, author of Nuclear Iran, The Birth of an Atomic State, which is going to be released later this summer. Dr Lee Jones from Queen Mary, University of London. Antonius Zanakopoulos, author of Disobeying the Security Council, Countermeasures Against Wrongful Sanctions, and Over the Line from Moscow by Dmitry Babic, our in-house political analyst. OK, to get the ball rolling, I'd like to get a single-sentence answer from each of you to the following question. First of all, to you, David, are sanctions a useful diplomatic tool or a blunt stick? If used in conjunction with diplomacy and in preference to military action, then they can be, yes. And Antonius? They're a useful tool, but they're also a very, very complicated tool with very many variables that need to be considered. And Dr Lee Jones? Well, history shows that sanctions fail in the vast majority of cases and they have a lot of negative side effects. I think they're more useful in expressing our own outrage than really affecting change in other countries. And Dimitri in Moscow? The last time when sanctions were indeed successful, it was in South Africa in the early 90s. Now, I think 90% of the sanctions are just harmful. OK. Something I'd like to pick up on there that Dimitri was saying about the deployment of sanctions against South Africa in the 1990s. Maybe I'll turn to you, Dr Lee Jones, because you've obviously got the historical perspective. Can you shine a spotlight on when sanctions first became used and perhaps their early deployments and whether or not they were successful in places like Rhodesia and South Africa? Well, sanctions were first used at the UN level against Rhodesia in South Africa and they were used from the 1950s onwards. In the case of South Africa, you had oil embargoes and arms embargoes mooted and then imposed in the 60s and 70s. And what that actually did is allowed the South African state to build up import substitution industrialization. They built up a massive oil from coal industry and a massive arms industry and in fact they became arms exporters by the 1980s. So essentially what sanctions did is boosted a massive military industrial complex that strengthened the National Party's grip on power. And then in the 1980s, you got more sanctions around investment, trade, finance, things like that. But even then, the impact was extremely modest. And exports actually rose by 27% in the year after most sanctions were imposed in the mid-80s. People talk about South Africa as being the case of success and sometimes the only case of success. But actually, their contribution was very modest. What won South African non-whites their freedom was the mass mobilisation of blacks on the streets through the United Democratic Front and trade union movement. They were able to render the country ungovernable and whites faced a choice either between perpetual unrest and potentially revolution or making some kind of settlement. And it was that mass mobilisation, people struggling for their own liberation rather than sanctions that wrought that change. And I think Western campaigners have taken the wrong message from South Africa. They have looked at it and thought, well, we actually liberated South Africa. Sanctions saved South Africa. And they think that you can just take that tool and deploy it in other circumstances. And I think that's very misguided. Was there no added impetus? from the sanctions. I mean, there were the economic sanctions you referred to and those fairly high-profile sporting boycotts, which I suppose are a sanction of another form. Did they not give some kind of moral impetus to the blacks who were campaigning against white minority rule? Well, blacks already knew firsthand that apartheid was immoral. They did not need external sanctions to tell them. And in terms of the white population... They were changing their minds from the 1970s onwards. Very little to do with sanctions, more to do with social development attendant on economic growth, the emergence of a middle class and the so-called velicta or enlightened elements in South African society. I don't think sports sanctions had very much impact. 
I did a lot of field work in South Africa last year, tried in vain to find any proof that they had had a political impact of any real significance and really couldn't find it. And Dimitri, you cited South Africa as one of the examples, or indeed the only example, of a success of the use of sanctions. Do you disagree, therefore, with what Dr Lee Jones was saying? I don't disagree 100%, but I think that certainly the sanctions pushed the South African elite to relinquishing power. I think President F.W. de Klerk, he wanted to be a part of respected family of international leaders. He was actually pushed by the same motives as Mikhail Gorbachev in Russia. He certainly did not want to dismantle completely the National Party. I mean, recently, just at the recent election, when I interviewed whom would he vote for, he said, I wanted to vote for the National Party, but it's now part of the African National Congress, so I cannot vote for them. But certainly, the sanctions did have an impact on the South African economic elite. These people wanted more economic success. They wanted to get out of the ghetto, and they understood that it was easier for them to have some kind of an agreement with the black majority than to continue their rule as they had done before that. And also, I think the black majority progressed a lot during the 60s and 70s. If you remember when Mandela was put in prison, he was still a radical. He had just made a trip to Algeria where he was trained basically for what now would be called terrorist operations. But during his stay in jail, certainly he himself and the black majority progressed a lot. And by the beginning of the 90s, when sanctions were actually lifted, these people were ready to become responsible voters and to take power. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm James Rinal, and we're taking a look at using economic sanctions against errant leaders. I'm joined by David Patrick Arakos, author of Nuclear Iran, The Birth of an Atomic State, Dr. Lee Jones from Queen Mary University of London, Antonius Zanakopoulos, author of Disobeying the Security Council, Countermeasures Against Wrongful Sanctions, and our in-house political analyst, Dmitry Babich, over the line from Moscow. Antonius, turning to one of your areas of expertise, imposing sanctions and the technical aspects of it. Take the UN Security Council, for example, saying that all global financial institutions must freeze the funds and assets of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, or all countries must stop any weapons trading with North Korea, or everyone must place a travel ban on General Antonia Injai, who led the recent coup in Guinea-Bissau. Is it fair to say that realising these rules on the ground, universally across the whole world, is an enormous logistical challenge, and how is it put into effect? It is truly an enormous challenge, but before we even go into implementing the sanctions, and there are problems there. It's deciding what kind of sanctions are going to be used in every case, and that impacts on effectiveness in many cases. So when we're talking about UN-imposed sanctions, we're talking about the Security Council determining that a particular situation constitutes a threat to the peace. And the objective of the sanctions is to remove that threat to the peace. It is to force a, a recalcitrant regime back into line effectively. And there are many ways to do that, and there have been many ways that have been tried. You could have comprehensive sanctions like the ones we had originally in Iraq, and they're a very blunt instrument and caused enormous hardship. And then we moved into targeted sanctions, which can be targeted with respect to specific commodities or arms. So we have arms embargoes, we have oil embargoes, but we've also had timber embargoes, diamond embargoes, etc., etc. And then we have even more targeted sanctions with respect to people, i.e. personal travel bans, freezing of assets. Other examples have to do with sanctions busting and how do you deal with sanctions busting. The Security Council does have monitoring groups in place and panels of experts who try to tell the Council exactly how arms dealers, for example, may be breaking the sanctions. But one example is you just ship tiny pieces from Eastern Europe or from all around the world which are not themselves banned and then you assemble attack helicopters. So there's always loads of ways around them? There's always loads of ways around them, but it's a, a sort of a cat and mouse game. As law enforcement, you will always find ways to break the law and then law enforcement must find new ways to stop the breaking of the law. But there are other types of problems, and these have to do with over and under compliance in a way. We have over compliance with sanctions, generally in the in the West or the North, if you want. And we have under compliance in, in many developing countries precisely because they don't have the capacity to actually implement many of the sanctions.